Total War Three Kingdoms released last year, the first mainline historical title in the Total War series since Attila, imparting its distinguished Total War brand of strategic and tactical nuance on this heavily romanticized period of ancient China. With more than a year of feature additions, gameplay improvements, bug fixes, DLC and chapter packs, we take our retrospective look on the game and assess whether it compares favourably to other Total War games, particularly the historical titles. In this review, we will comprehensively cover a range of topics including the game's presentation, with its graphics and performance, the campaigns which form the crux of the strategic Total War experience, and the battles which provide much of the gameplay value, all while appraising how well the historical authenticity or context of this time period is executed. This is Total War Three Kingdoms, a year in review. Developers Creative Assembly have established themselves in the last decade as a major competitor in the crowded strategy market, with their unique blend of turn-based grand strategy and real-time tactical battles. The Total War series is also reputable for covering many historical periods of military interest, such as Rome, the Middle Ages, or the Napoleonic era. With Three Kingdoms, Total War makes its first venture into China and a fateful return to an East Asian setting, last seen with Shogun 2. This is a massive deal because the immense military history of China is ripe for representation in this series, and the Three Kingdoms is arguably China's most renowned, romanticized, and referenced historical time period. Famous mainstream games covering this topic have already been produced, such as through Japanese studio Koei's Romance of the Three Kingdoms and its spin-off Dynasty Warriors, but these present themselves as an arcade-like casual experience. As a result, this is the first time the Three Kingdoms period has been adapted into a grand military perspective with a semi-realistic portrayal of periodic warfare, thanks to its representation in the Total War engine. It is also the first mainline historical game since Total War Attila, released in 2015, ever since the splitting of development efforts between CA's three product lines. Creative Assembly have recently focused on their Warhammer series for the past few years, whilst Thrones of Britannia in 2018 saw the introduction of their saga titles, which explores a smaller historical scope in a condensed Total War setting. Thus, it has been quite a wait for the fellow Total War enthusiasts to finally get a classic, grandiose historical experience. But this game's context should also appeal to the newer fantasy fans attracted to the series through the Warhammer titles. And that's something we will discuss extensively in this video, how Total War Three Kingdoms tries to appeal to both the newer and older fans alike. Total War Three Kingdoms released to almost universal acclaim in May 2019 thanks to its unusually stable performance at launch, its delicate and insightful vision of ancient China, and massive gameplay improvements that oversaw a huge generational leap from previous historical titles. Over the past year or so since its release, numerous DLCs have also been added. In this video, we will cover the base game alongside the Day One Yellow Turban Rebellion DLC, the free LC legendary characters, including including Tao Chan and White Tiger Yan, the Reign of Blood cosmetic DLC, and the three chapter packs that include the Eight Princes, Mandate of Heaven, and A World Betrayed. The newest DLC, The Furious Wild, will be covered in a later review. The Three Kingdoms period was the tripartite division of China into three states that claimed suzerainty over all of China as rightful emperors, lasting from the years 220 to 280 CE. 
However, the game more specifically explores the period preceding this when various warlords wrestled over control of the country during the final days of the Han Dynasty, with the Three Kingdoms adapted into a mechanic that serves as the endgame. As an immensely rich but complex historical period involving political intrigue, military struggle, and stories of character renown, I suggest players who wish to get into this title to educate themselves beforehand with the context of the time period, and I recommend over simple video on the Three Kingdoms, which was part of the official marketing campaign for the game. Total War Three Kingdoms retains the two classic modes of play, the campaign and battle mode. The campaign, played on a massive scaled map of China in a turn-based game mode, sees the player and AI make strategic decisions before ending their turn and advancing time. Any battles initiated by forces on the campaign map can then be played in real time in a realistic tactical simulator. Of course, battles can be played through custom lobbies against the AI or on multiplayer as well. And there are a few notable historical battles, as is the case with every historical Total War. The game is also supplemented by a new dynasty mode where legendary characters of the Three Kingdoms take on hordes of enemies by themselves, very much inspired by Koei's Dynasty Warriors games. This however plays out like an extra minigame and is not quintessential to the core experience, so for the purposes of this review we will be focusing solely on the campaign and battle modes only. Developers Creative Assembly have taken two stylistic approaches to Total War Three Kingdoms, providing two relatively distinct experiences for players. Both are influenced by two respective Chinese historical texts that provide a literary account of this time period. Records Mode is based on the records of the Three Kingdoms, a historiographical piece written during the 3rd century providing a comprehensive account of military events. Consequently, this mode has been interpreted as a more realistic but darker and grittier take on the period focused around the political developments and military actions during the Three Kingdoms era. In this mode, tactical norms wins battles and strategic thinking turns the gears of war, shaping the sandbox experience as one where the player is in control of a faction embroiled in a massive civil war for China. Consequently, this mode attempts to appeal towards Total War fans already seasoned with the classic formula from other historical titles. Romance Mode, on the other hand, is based on the 14th century novel, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Part historical, part legend, and part mythical, this story illustrates a more dramatic and sensational perspective on the Three Kingdoms period, revolving around character-driven storylines. In this mode, legendary characters and their choices shape the events of the conflict, whilst their acts of valor on the battlefield determine the winners and losers, providing a soap opera-like experience focusing on dynamic relationships between the participants, rather than the greater conflict between their factions. If I could describe the comparison between Records and Romance Mode for people unfamiliar with Three Kingdoms, it would be like Records Mode as akin to watching a military documentary about the Napoleonic Wars, whilst Romance Mode on the other hand would be like exploring Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. Both of them cover the same military context, but each from very different perspectives. It's obvious this mechanic was done to appeal to two sets of players. Classic Total War enthusiasts may gravitate towards records mode, whilst romance may prove attractive to fans coming from Koei's character-focused games such as Dynasty Warriors or fans of CA's fantasy Warhammer series, which also had a focus on larger-than-life legendary lords. The decision to branch into two paths was admirable, but the execution ended up being quite uninspiring, with only one mode truly worth playing. As we will explore further in this video, there are core differences between the two modes that will reveal why that is the case. Total War Three Kingdoms with all of its DLCs has several different starting dates for the campaign, each covering a different chapter of time during the Three Kingdoms period. The game released with the vanilla 190CE starting date, but DLC chapter packs have since added new starting dates. The vanilla campaign of Total War Three Kingdoms is known as Rise of the Warlords and begins in 190CE, right after the tyrant Dong Zhou has taken control of the young emperor and fleed westward to Chang'an, setting the old capital Lu Yang alight and raising the city. As centralized power of the Han Dynasty has collapsed, 
Yu, as the player, hopes to either unify China as one of the various warlords or governors, or liberate China from the corrupt Feiyu dynasty as one of the bandit or yellow turban characters. This campaign is a perfect starting point for newer players, as everyone besides Dong Zhou, the de facto leader of the Han, starts off small and insignificant, giving equal opportunity for all factions to grow and expand. The first chapter pack was released in August 2019, barely three months after launch, and focuses on the post Three Kingdoms period in 291 CE. A generation has already passed since the unification of China under the Jin Dynasty, though a new civil war erupts with eight characters from the ruling clan vying for control. This conflict is known as the War of the Eight Princes, but without any continuity or connection with the earlier campaigns, combined with an apathetic execution from the developers, this was the most poorly received campaign. The Mandate of Heaven DLC, released in January of this year, introduces an earlier campaign date set eight years prior to the main campaign in 182 CE, right before the Yellow Turban Rebellion erupts across China. The rebellion was a peasant revolt against the Han Dynasty, caused by discontent against the central government and accentuated by famine and natural disasters. In this campaign, the player can choose to play as the House of Han, or one of the characters loyal to the Han, attempting to maintain stability and defend the empire from the rebellion, or alternatively as one of the three Jang brothers who lead the rebellion in its infancy. This was a decently received campaign with an interesting premise for players who wish to indulge in a more defensive approach, akin to playing the Western or Eastern Roman Empire in Total War Attila, trying to hold on to a massive but unstable and crumbling dynasty. A World Betrayed DLC is the latest chapter pack, released in March of this year, beginning in 194 CE. By this time, many major historical factions have established themselves as champions for unification. This chapter pack has a particular intimate focus on two new warlords, Lu Bu and Sun Tse, who themselves lead new factions. The campaigns focus on crucial Free Kingdoms lore, pivotal historical events and fan favorite characters has made this the standout campaign in terms of enjoyability and gameplay innovation. With this period romanticizing heavily the exploits of legends and heroes, Total War Three Kingdoms brings to the table the most developed character system ever in Total War. And to take advantage of that, the game as of now contains close to a hundred unique legendary characters, including additions from Free LC, DLC, and patches. Of course, many of the famous figures of the Three Kingdoms have been included, and some are faction leaders depending on the different chapter dates. For instance, Cao Cao, Liu Bei, and Sun Jian, the leaders that paved the way for the states of Wei, Shu Han, and Wu respectively. They begin with a selection of noteworthy characters to complement them. Cao Cao starts off with the Jiahu cousins, Liu Bei starts with Guan Yu and Zhang Fei, and Sun Jian begins with Huang Gai and his sons and daughter, giving the factions a variety of initial leadership options. Most players will gravitate towards D3, as they are the most popular and have the easiest starting positions. There are lesser known warlords such as Yuan Shao and Gong Sun Zan, or governors such as Matang and Tao Chen, each having very slight differences to playstyle. Bandits operate very differently from other factions, reasonably difficult and recommended for veteran players who wish for a more abrasive, mercenary-like playstyle. Yan Bai Hu, available as free LC, is one such example. Finally, the Yellow Turbans, available with the Day 1 release DLC, introduces a new subset of factions with completely different objectives to liberate China from what they consider to be the corrupt, toothless and vestigial Han government. This is the most unique experience in Total War of Three Kingdoms, thanks to the unique unit roster, characters, administration and gameplay mechanics. All Yellow Turban factions start in dangerously unstable areas with aggressive opponents on all sides. As such, they are considered difficult. Besides the starting factions and their associated noteworthy characters, there will be personnel of legendary repute scattered across the map. Some begin in minor factions or come of age in later years as the campaign progresses. For instance, Cao Cao's renowned general Zhu Huang starts in service of the Han Empire and would need some convincing to join his beloved faction. Other characters will be generated through events, such as Yue Jin, who joins Cao Cao within the first few turns, whilst the famous strategist Zhu Jie Liang and Sima Yi spawn much later in the game. 
Creative Assembly have certainly provided a strong roster of pivotal Free Kingdoms characters with many more expected to be introduced later. For instance, patch 1.5 that released in March of this year introduced to the game 16 new legendary characters free for all players. Characters prove instrumental to the unique experience of Total War Free Kingdoms as we will explore through their gameplay impact later on. This is the first time China has been represented in Total War, and indeed it is breathtaking. Despite covering a relatively small piece of the world, it features a decent amount of geographical variation. The map features the entirety of the relevant regions to the Three Kingdoms period, and all of the historical Chinese provinces of the late Han Dynasty. There are fertile agriculture regions such as the North China Plain and Sichuan Basin, desert steppes near Inner Mongolia and Western China, tropical jungles in the Southlands or temperate forests scattered around the many mountainous regions on the map. The islands of Hainan and Taiwan are also represented. As a result, there is considerable geographical variation, despite the scope of the map being much smaller than, say, Rome 2 or Attila. That's probably a statement about China itself, which does feature many biomes in its geography in real life. But nevertheless, some effort was made to indulge the players with a unique environment for each faction. Regardless, many will still feel much repetition as it will be difficult to experience all of this variation in a single campaign, and the lack of diverse cultures is still a damning negative to the game's replayability. One of the major reasons why Total War Three Kingdoms was such a hit at launch was because it was the first time in a while a Total War game had released with a full-bodied audiovisual experience that was surprisingly stable, performance-friendly, and had minimal bugs. CA's depiction of ancient China is beautiful, and the upgraded Warscape engine pulls off one of the most authentic cultural experiences ever in this series. First things first, however, every player should turn off sharpening. This option causes a really weird effect that sharpens edges to the point of over-aliasing and creates weird shimmering around objects. This was one of the first things recommended on Reddit and the Total War forums to turn off, and results in a truer graphical experience we can pass proper judgement on. As we explored before in the geography and map design, the Three Kingdoms world is filled with different regions, climates and terrains, and combining that with five different seasons per year are filters and particle effects that make every turn a different feeling at each location in this depiction of China. There is a lot of natural beauty here, much more than in previous titles. Birds and leaves flying around the sandstone pillar mountains in the autumn breeze, a herd of deer seeking a stream during winter snow, giant pandas in the spring rain, or horses resting under the desert summer sun. Other minor details include the yellow river actually looking well yellow with its silt and mud content. There is a distinct peaceful Asian feel around the campaign map with straw hat peasants working the fields, rickshaws carrying goods, or the shrines, temples, and other architectural marvels scattered around the map. It's a faithful portrayal of ancient China, but it's also a particularly homely feel that is quite relaxing. Again, I can't stress how important it is to turn sharpening off, as it is very apparent in battles. Regardless, battles are an exceptionally pretty affair, and it's my belief that this is the most beautiful battle engine of any Total War game. Firstly, the battle map themselves are well designed, textures are very smooth compared to older titles. I mean, comparing them with previous games, the graphics gap becomes quite apparent. Unit design is very much indicative of the period, as many soldiers within the armies wear simple clad armor, headbands, and basic peasant clothing. Players will encounter this theme throughout most of their battles with low to mid-tier troops, so it does get repetitive. Combine that with the limited variety in the unit roster, something we will explore later on, it does become a sordid affair looking at the same units many times over. It's only once you reach the late game units where there are some explicitly stylish unit designs, such as the Dragon or Imperial Palace units. 
It's obviously not Warhammer in terms of variety and design, but it's not too far off the mark historically speaking anyway, because the bulk of such conflicts during this period were fought between huge masses of peasantry. And besides, there are more aesthetic unit design improvements on the Steam Workshop. I think one of the reasons why units themselves are more basic in appearance is to highlight the character models of your generals. Most of the legendaries have their own custom 3D model in-game, and these, for the most part, are also well designed. Everyone will have their own favourites, but Dong Zhou, Ma Chao, Guan Yu and Zun Yu are among my favourite models. They are extremely unique also, in that if you appreciate the lore or recognise the name, you can reliably tell who they are at a glance, without being too confused as to who's who, sort of like in Warhammer 2 with that game's immense amount of legendary lords, but since they are all so well designed, you can say, ah, I know who that is, straight away. A nice touch to unit regiments that instantly screams out China are the battle flags. Several soldiers will carry assorted flags indicating their faction colours and insignia into battle. Once they engage the enemy, they will pin the flags into the ground before taking out their weapons, which makes for an awesome cinematic spectacle. This honestly makes me wish for a similar mechanic in say Rome 2 Total War or future Total War games, whereby taking enemy battle standards or retrieving your own had some meaning. Units will also carry lanterns during night battles and release them into the sky before engaging enemies. Again, a nice touch that assists the East Asian immersion. Fire arrows are absolutely amazing in this game, evoking a ferocity that is quite stunning visually, starting spot fires on the ground or in foliage. They are a visual treat particularly during night battles. Normal arrow trails are still kind of obnoxious, but nothing that mods can't solve however. There is also a difference between records and romance modes in the graphics department. This is a setting in the options that changes the filter of the screen and has a noticeable difference in the atmospheric portrayal. Records can be described as an almost neo-noir filter that dampens the colouring and lowers the contrast, creating a darker and grittier shading, perhaps emphasising the true nature of the Three Kingdoms as a brutally chaotic time. It is very similar to the filter in Total War Attila, which also portrayed a dark atmosphere. On the contrary, Romance Mode applies a vivid filter that brings out the colours and lighting of the engine. As its name suggests, it presents a portrayal of this era as romantic and mythical, similar to Warhammer. I actually prefer Romance Filter a lot as it feels more high definition and helps to bring out the graphics engine's fidelity, though it is probably a lot less photorealistic. Purchasing the Reign of Blood DLC allows the option to enable blood effects and dismemberment in-game, producing a violent, gory but greatly entertaining spectacle. This is the first game where these options can actually be personalised without the use of mods, allowing the changing of particle and stain scales to fine-tune exactly how much blood you want to see. Of course, to truly appreciate battles, the sound design must be considered and it's safe to say it's a pleasing experience. Of particular note is cavalry. There is a certain strength and thundering energy to the sound of cavalry in this game that makes you want to follow them with the camera. My favourite feature of the battle audio are unit responses when issuing commands or selecting them. Units will audibly respond as a group, shouting one-liners in unison, giving a very spirited feeling to the player in command. There's also a cool feature that generals will also narrate events on the battlefield and will also banter and exchange insults with opposing generals, helping again to establish the characterization this game upholds. As an appreciator of in-game music, I've never found Total War games to be the epitome of great gaming soundtracks. With Total War Three Kingdoms, the music is forced to be fairly unique, simply for the fact the game covers a cultural theme that hasn't been explored yet in the series. Incorporating traditional Chinese instruments such as the erhu or the plucking of the gu cheng, points must be given for the authenticity alone, and if there's a critical factor of music in this game, it's that it definitely fits the Three Kingdoms aesthetic. I 
I wish there were some dramatic anthems or upbeat melodic tunes such as those shown in the trailers. Interestingly, these were made by Dynamedian, the same group who composed wonderful tracks for such games as the Anno series. So overall, there is not much criticism or high praise here, and I can only describe the soundtrack as thematically satisfying, but not particularly memorable or amazing. One of the most impressive improvements to Total War Three Kingdoms is its UI, which has taken huge strides from previous games to limit the obscurity of the player's display whilst providing enough essential information at a glance. At the core of this UI theme are black paint strokes, accentuating a more free-flowing design compared to the rigidity of previous interfaces. This lack of straight lines gives the impression of UI minimalism and seamlessness, ultimately providing more space for the player to absorb the real action on screen. The minimalist theme of the UI is evident in the battle mode. Firstly, you can see how the entire unit roster is pushed towards the bottom left of the screen, immediately providing more screen space than other titles. Now, this may not seem like a big deal, but for a game with heavy micromanagement during its intense battles, being able to, at a glance, just see more of the action is vital. Second of all, the unit icons, and I absolutely love the execution of this. It harkens back to the Attila icons, which was a huge minimalist jump from Rome 2's big, distracting unit flags. In Three Kingdoms, the unit icon circles convey all the necessary stats required for commanders. Green for friendly, red for enemy, with the color's fullness indicating the HP or numerical strength of the unit. It also indicates the unit type through the weapon, again much easier to grasp compared to Rome 2. Elite units will also be highlighted with a golden border, making it easy to target or be aware of in an otherwise clustered battlefield. Wavering units will have their circles flash, whilst broken unit icons will be replaced by a white flag. Shattered units lose the icon circle altogether and just has a plain white flag, again reducing the distraction as they are now considered redundant units which can be completely ignored. This UI allows effortless glancing from the player to quickly assess the situation of battle and respond. Small quality of life options are also available in this game as well, such as drag out outlines, which make the unit drag out significantly less CPU heavy and again less distracting. Or unit category sorting, which sorts units by type in the bottom bar to allow for easy grouping and selection. Likewise, campaign interface has been improved for increased readability. Most obvious to returning Total War players is the zoom level affecting how much information is shown on screen. Close to the ground, county names, building types and critical statistics can be hovered over, providing the usual standard Total War interface. Zooming out further provides a much cleaner, expansive view which exemplifies settlement locations, borders and army movements. This is extremely useful to grasp the local situation wherever the camera is placed. Zooming out even further transitions into a strategic view that was implemented in Rome 2, also known as the tab view. This opens up the filter options which allow highlighting of diplomatic ownership, attitudes or statistical data through color codes. It is a much more seamless and clean execution which allows a player to grasp the required information quickly. In other regards, the UI is pretty similar in terms of location of tabs, screens and panels, but there is a particular focus around characters, something which we will explain further in the video. I do however want to highlight the reforms tree, which is Free Kingdom's take on research and is designed around the cherry blossom. Although mechanically, reforms are not very different to research trees from previous games, it is such a unique and creative design that could have only been done with an East Asian theme, so kudos to CA for taking advantage of that. Of course, the game's default language is English, with voice actors providing a passable performance that isn't terribly accentuated or exaggerated. As long as he controls the court, he controls the empire. In peace. 
I shall be an able subject. In chaos, a crafty hero. However, the real kicker is the game's inclusion of full Chinese audio, which can be activated in the options. Now, as a non-Mandarin or Chinese speaker myself, I have to take the word of others for this, but the community has said that the voice acting is actually very poetic and indicative of an old style romantic form of Chinese. From a Westerner's perspective, to truly immerse yourself, I highly recommend to play with Chinese audio and English subtitles, as it just adds this sort of flavor you can't get with other Total War games. The language barrier also helps to reduce the feeling of repetition as repeated audio cues won't be as obvious to the player. <laughs> Perhaps the most appealing factor to Total War of Three Kingdoms is its amazing performance. This game produces higher frame rates and a smoother visual experience than both previous Warhammer titles and Total War Attila, despite an overall improvement in the graphics quality. Sure, late game performance issues with long turn times and battle stuttering with thousands and thousands of troops are still present, but it will be a longer while before you begin to experience them. In terms of stability, I don't think I've ever gotten a crash on the vanilla unmodded version, and that is a real testament to CA's improved launches in past years, with Warhammer 2 and now Three Kingdoms hopefully curing the reputation of bug-ridden instable launch messes that has developed as a result of Rome 2's launch, and it's a massive benchmark they should aspire towards for future releases. If there were any bugs, for the most part they were not game-breaking and mostly ignorable. It's also important to mention this game was actually delayed at release, launching more than two months after its slated release date, and it's clear there was extra effort to enhance performance and stability. Central to the campaign of Total War Three Kingdoms is the Chinese philosophical idea of Wu Xing, or the Five Elements. This crucially important concept manifests itself extensively in Chinese culture, and this game employs Wu Xing to justify many of its gameplay elements, in turn providing a dynamic experience. The Five Elements in Wu Xing are Water, colored blue, Wood, colored green, Fire, colored red, Earth, colored yellow, and Metal, colored purple. Buildings, the reforms tree, unit types, even character traits are all categorized into these elements. And we will make references to how the Wuxing system is adopted in this game as we progress through analysis of the campaign mechanics. Upon entering the campaign map, players will immediately realize a different region slash province system for this iteration of Total War, with counties making up the smallest category of land and two or more counties making up a commandery. This system of administrative divisions was in use during the Han Empire, so some points for accurate adaptation here. This system also sees Total War return to separated resource buildings that can be attacked and conquered, such as iron mines or fishing ports, immediately giving your faction access to the resources. Unifying commanderies allows a city, the administrative capital of a commandery, to provide powerful economic bonuses to all of its lesser counties. In previous Total War games, conquering regions were enough to reap in the benefits of particular resources, but in this game, you have to invest money into building appropriate infrastructure to take advantage of said resources. Many commanderies have a main element of focus. For instance, if a commandery has access to farmlands and livestock, such as Chen Commandery here, it is imperative to focus on agriculture or the wood element buildings labeled in green. So all the wood element or green building chains such as irrigated farms, government support and grain storage will have great synergy with the agriculture resources of this commandery. A more industrial focused commandery such as Jianye will benefit more from the metal element or purple building chains. 
Some commanderies, particularly coastal areas, will concentrate around commerce or the blue colored water element buildings. All commanderies on the map will have a specific focus on one of these three industries, or a combination of them. The earth building chain in yellow, representing the traits of authority, links to administrative or religious buildings, whilst fire represents the red military building chains. These two chains respectively are subject to adaptation and built depending on the player's strategic needs around the map. The specific economic focuses of each commandery does tend to lend itself to repetition however, as players will mostly just memorize what's the most efficient chain to build at each region. It's hard to judge this mechanic as it's different enough from previous Total War games to feel fresh, but ends up being too one-dimensional to feel memorable. Total War Rome 2 introduced the mechanic of navigable rivers to the campaign map, perhaps to increase the influence of naval forces inland. In a similar vein, the Three Kingdoms map has access to the major rivers of China, specifically the Yellow, Yangtze and Pearl River. Not only does it allow armies to move efficiently across the map to redeploy to other regions of China, it also increases the strategic value of commanderies that are on the rivers themselves. However, without naval battles and the ability to raid trade routes, the potential of this campaign map feature, I feel, has not been fully realized. There are also several pins scattered around the map that provide some contextual information to famous locations in China, such as the major rivers or mountains that have spiritual significance in Chinese religion. At the beginning of a campaign, map pins will also highlight key persons or factions of interest historically associated with your own. Unfortunately, besides adding some brief world building, there isn't any gameplay value to these and I was quite surprised there isn't any wonders mechanic like in Rome 2, encouraging the capture of some culturally revered location to receive minor campaign buffs. The player can also make their own pins, uh, not sure why though, maybe to denote the site of famous battles they participated in? Though that just makes me wonder what happened to the famous battle markers that was a core feature on the campaign map in previous historical Total War titles. Ready for further orders. Five seasons are implemented into Total War Three Kingdoms, again influenced by the five Wuxing elements, with the year starting in spring, then advancing to summer, harvest, autumn and finally winter. Despite the increase in turns per year, probably a design decision to artificially slow down the year timer, there aren't many inherent differences to each season besides visual changes. Winter is the only real troublesome season as it reduces the fertility of all regions on the map, thus food reserves can swing dramatically. But winter only lasts a turn and experienced players will generally cater to the expected drop in food. Seasons probably have more military impact as winter discourages sieges and battles due to morale and maneuverability issues. Armies also get higher supply penalties during winter, but again, that's something that can be accounted for with adequate preparation. Food has been a crucial part of historical titles since its introduction into Shogun 2, and Total War Three Kingdoms introduces the latest and perhaps greatest iteration to this system. Food is produced by agriculture buildings and stockpiles into a global reserve. As a resource, food is distributed to the population through cities and are required in some building chains. It is obviously imperative that food must be positively maintained to keep army supplied and the population happy and growing. Food also has immense strategic importance as a diplomatic tool. For the first time ever, surplus food can be traded to other factions. Considering that high fertility agricultural regions spawn in certain parts of the map, some factions will have an advantage in obtaining food over others. To compensate this, the ability to trade food becomes crucial for the disadvantaged factions as reaching the late game generally comes with an immense demand for food. Population growth is also simulated in Three Kingdoms Total War. In general, you want to grow your population as fast as possible as higher thresholds increase peasantry income, forming the backbone of your tax economy. Immigration, food surplus and public order are all major factors that influence population growth. However, population has little gameplay value otherwise. I also find it grows too quickly, it's kind of too easy to manage and without much impetus to keep track of or utilize it in any meaningful way. Trade on the other hand has been pleasantly expanded and this is one of the economic avenues players can choose to pursue for income. Trade agreements and their value are subject to a new mechanic called influence. 
higher influence against a trade partner will allow you to siphon off more tariffs. On the other hand, if that partner dominates you with their higher influence, your income will be reduced. This creates interesting diplomatic dynamics as factions may feel like certain agreements are not worth it and will readily decline offers or end current ones depending on their personalities. There are various resources scattered around the campaign map also, and owning these gives you several advantages. Firstly, because some are required for constructing certain buildings. And secondly, having access to resources makes you a potentially lucrative trade partner. I also like how emphasized the importance of trade is in this game, as depending on your playstyle, you can formulate trade as your primary income source. Certain factions, such as Kong Rong, are dedicated to such playstyles and will appeal to players that prefer diplomatic appeasement and economic domination. The most pronounced change in Total War Three Kingdoms is its attention on characters. Characters form the crux of many gameplay mechanics, leading factions, administering politics, commanding armies, or even spying with subterfuge. The game begins with hundreds of historically accurate characters and their families, steadily getting replaced by others that come of age later or randomized generic templates as the former die off. All the characters in this game are categorized by type into the five elements of Wu Xing. The element of fire is represented by the Vanguard, generals which excel at breaking through enemy troops and are offensive based characters with their focus around shock and assault cavalry. The Earth of Element is represented by the Commander, an authoritative figure that excels at inspiring friendly troops. Their military focus is Sword Cavalry. The Element of Water is embodied by the Strategist, who enable formations in friendly armies whilst disrupting and impairing the effectiveness of the enemy. Their military focus is on range units and artillery. The Metal Element is represented by Sentinels, a defensive-based character that excels at locking down enemies and holding positions, especially on the front line. Their military focus is Melee Infantry. Finally, the Wood Element is represented by Champions, who excel at engaging other generals in duels, usually paired with Spear or Polearm Infantry. The major overview of characters can be seen in the Character screen. Here is one such screen with Lu Bu, after we achieved Emperorship and unified China with his faction. From the top, we can see that Lu Bu is a Vanguard class, very fitting due to his tempestuous nature. As a character of legendary repute, Lu Bu has his own custom artwork, and every legendary historical character will have their own specially drawn art. Legendaries also have their name colored in gold to differentiate their status, and a title which endows their personality based on their respective historical context. As we can see, Lu Bu is the warrior without equal. This title boosts his expertise, resolve, and instinct traits, and provides some faction-wide bonuses if he is in a position of power. We can also see how this affects his personality, as Lu Bu appreciates physical strength and ability and supports the idea of warfare. There is also a brief overview of his backstory, again for some historical context and immersive flavor. Some of his more obvious information, such as rank and age, are also displayed. The majority of this screen, however, is an overview of his stats and traits. Every character has points from 0 to 100 invested into 5 trees that govern their personality and dictate their military prowess, again based off the 5 elements of Wu Xing. Increasing any of these trees provides specific bonuses to the character in relation to the philosophical quality that element represents. For instance, increasing Lu Bu's wood element strengthens his resolve, improving his health pool in combat. Reaching 100 in any of these trees unlocks even more powerful bonuses. For instance, Lu Bu currently has 128 points in his expertise, which unlocks the skill Tempered Deflection. We can also observe that their character type also skews their stats towards one specific tree. As a vanguard, Lu Bu naturally has a lot of progression in his fire element, or instinct, increasing his melee damage. In records mode, there are some inherent differences in these bonuses to appropriate more realism. For instance, resolve in this mode increases the general's bodyguard size instead of their health pool. To the right of the stats are the character's traits, and many will begin the campaign with three, before gaining more depending on happenstances, interactions, or events as the campaign progresses. Traits give or take bonuses from certain trees, they add more personality modifiers, and may provide battle abilities or campaign modifiers. Lu Bu starts with the Defiant, Formidable, and Disloyal traits, but he also has gained 4 more by this campaign's end. 
Characters that get wounded in battle can also develop permanent injuries. Lubu is currently scarred, which is also represented as a trait. Below this is the skill tree. As characters gain experience and rank up, they unlock a range of class-specific skills through this skill tree progression. Every character will have access to roughly the same skills depending on their character type. So every Vanguard character will see a roughly similar skill tree as Lubu. This is an amalgamation of both Rome 2 or Attila's authority, cunning and zeal stat trees and Warhammer's experience skill tree, adding a very strong RPG element to the experience. On the left of the screen is the ancillaries, showing equipped weapons, armor, mounts, followers and accessories that accompany the character. Again, they each provide their own set of stat bonuses, battle abilities and campaign modifiers. There are hundreds of ancillaries in this game which can be found by capturing or constructing certain buildings, obtaining them through campaign events, or just simply stealing them from other characters after defeating them in battle. You can also trade ancillaries through the diplomacy screen. Ancillaries range from common rarities all the way to uniques. Lubu here has a unique halberd, the Sky Piercer, his unique set of armor, his infamous horse, the Red Hare, a unique follower, Hua Tu, and an exceptional porcelain cup as an accessory, each of these providing their own set of powerful buffs. There are also set bonuses which add an extra dimension to itemization. Choosing your character's equipment is a metagame in its own right, pushing the RPG elements of the gameplay. It would be incredibly lousy if characters, especially those of legendary repute, could die with just one untimely death. So Creative Assembly have added a resilience mechanic into this game, which is pretty much equatable to a multiple lives system, helping to preserve the array of legendary characters. This is similar to the mechanic in Rome 2 or Attila, where certain famous historical characters such as Augustus, Aurelian or Attila could not die with one death, instead requiring several consecutive defeats to finally perish and be removed from the game. In Three Kingdoms, if a general falls in battle, a resilience point is deducted, taking three turns to refresh. If they were to be slain again during that time, then they die forever. In Romance Mode, there are opportunities to receive even more resilience points, such as by attaining legendary stats in the Element Tree. As a result, if generals die, they progress through multiple resilience stages, from perfect condition, raring for battle, to slightly battered and bruised, but still capable of fighting to heavily injured and on the verge of death. It is sort of comparable to the Dungeons & Dragons Death's Door mechanic, which is amazing because with all this emphasis on characterization, it would be a shame if generals died too easily. In Records mode with its emphasis on realism, the resilience mechanic is much more diminished, giving less opportunities for generals to have second lives. And coupled with their fragility on the battlefield, care must be given to prevent an untimely death. In both modes, however, characters can still die outright through old age or assassination. The military tab gives a brief overview of the general's battle stats and the units in their retinue. We will cover this more in depth in the separate retinue section later. An important addition to enhance characterization are the relationships formed with other characters and factions. In the Relations tab, we can see Lubu's personality modifiers. This will affect how he perceives others and how they perceive him, nurturing friendships if they are like-minded or instigating rivalries if their personalities are at odds with each other. Meetings on the battlefield, diplomatic occurrences or story events will allow interactivity between characters, enriching their personal narratives and in creating one of the most character-driven experiences ever in a Total War game. Characters can also form relationships with certain factions. Many characters have natural affinities based on their historical Three Kingdoms loyalties. For instance, Zhao Yun, who initially begins with the faction of Gong Sun Zan, has a fondness for Liu Bei, a faction he would later serve until his death. Releasing a general many times after their capture can force them to feel indebted to your faction as well, allowing future employment. Through his past loyalties, we can see Lubu has been around a lot, offering his services to many factions before forming his own Kingdom of Yin. As a result, he has developed an extensive grudge list of factions he has deep-seated hatred for, incurring diplomatic penalties and negative relationships to anyone within that faction. However, he also has a fondness with a faction of Zhang Yang, buffing diplomacy and relationships, but also increasing the chance he may join that faction if his own one is dissolved. 
Satisfaction is a reworked mechanic from Rome 2's loyalty system. Each character in every faction has a satisfaction rating from 0 to 100, influenced by many factors including friendships, promotions, or government and reform effects. If a character reaches zero satisfaction, he or she will leave the faction upon turn end and seek employment elsewhere, possibly developing a faction hatred as well. It is therefore imperative for the player to maintain loyalty by keeping satisfaction high, or if possible to encourage affinities for your own faction to prevent them from leaving too easily. Resultingly, characters can be employed, given a wage that is deducted from the treasury every turn. New characters available for employment, perhaps after leaving another faction or recently spawned, will be notified to players with the People of Merit event, whilst a list of available candidates for hire will appear in the court screen. Characters can also be employed after battle capture, with their willingness dependent on their satisfaction with their current employer and any fondness for your faction. There is also a method of obtaining characters with use of the Undercover Network, which we will cover later. Trying to get as many legendary Free Kingdoms figures as you can becomes in itself a sort of Pokemon style catch more minigame, and it can really be only pulled off with this particular historical context, since the Three Kingdoms period saw many characters willingly switch loyalties in their efforts for a unified China. During employment, most characters will be idle at court in your capital city. They can then be sent on assignments in different commanderies to perform class-specific roles. For instance, Vanguard characters can increase replenishment rates for armies or reduce mustering turns. They can also hold office by promoting them to government positions in the court screen with a variety of different positions available. Again, traits and personalities affect their effectiveness in said role. Becoming Emperor will also expand government roles even further, providing more opportunities for promotion. Characters can also be assigned administrative roles governing entire commanderies and providing strong buffs to those regions. Their retinues also bolster the garrison of the city county. All of your faction's characters can be managed in the court screen, allowing promotion, removal from office, or releasing from service or even banishment. Patch 1.5 introduced a new mechanic called Title Ranks. These are extra titles unlocked through completing various objectives and awarded to characters by their leader, improving their salary, satisfaction, and often giving them stat buffs and powerful campaign or battle bonuses. This mechanic offers extra immersive flavor to reward generals that performed commendable feats, which many were bestowed upon during the real Three Kingdoms period. Close family characters can be overviewed in the family tree screen, and one of the most beloved Total War mechanics returns in Three Kingdoms. The ruling family will be shown here, indicating familial relations, children, and ancestral trees. Here you can find a spouse or marry existing characters within your faction, or select an heir among your children, or even adopt a new one. This is already the most in-depth iteration of family mechanics in Total War, and given dynastic influences in ancient Chinese culture, this has been an overall a pleasing improvement. Conclusively, Total War Three Kingdoms brings to the table the deepest and most meaningful character interaction and interpersonal dynamic gameplay ever seen in a Total War game, and by some margin as well. The implementation of Wu Xing as a way to justify stat growth, traits, and relationships is not only well executed, but fitting with the cultural theme of Three Kingdoms China. This empowers emotional investment for the player as they follow their characters and roleplay vicariously through their stories. As a result, it is hands down the best thing to have happened to the series as it opens up possibility for deeper character mechanics in future Total War games. Armies and the way they were recruited have been kind of uninspiring over the past decade. Most Total War games following a system of one leader commanding up to 20 units in a stack. With Total War Three Kingdoms, retinues have replaced the previous system, emphasizing the historical fact that troops tended to follow certain leaders into battle rather than show loyalty to a higher order faction during this period. Each character can therefore recruit up to six units into their personal retinue, with each character class restricting which units they can muster. Up to three retinues can then be deployed together in an army, therefore a total maximum of 21 units per army. Retinue units that are annihilated in battle won't disappear, instead they will be reformed within two turns. 
Furthermore, Red News can be recalled in their entirety and deployed in their entirety. This really helps the micromanagement aspect of armies, which can now be built, separated, and thrown around piecemeal with the retinue system. It especially helps if you want to strategically redeploy certain characters onto another front, without needing to move their units at the same time. Characters that become administrators for a commandery will also have their retinue bolster that city's garrison, adding a layer of strategic decision making if you wish to defend key regions or choke points on the campaign map. Overall, the retinue system is a huge mechanical leap from previous Total War games. Veterans of the series may be initially confused, but it is a superior system that not only reduces needless micromanagement, but enhances flexibility. I would be happy to see a similar system implemented for future Total War games, something like this context of the Crusades for instance, where soldiers and knights were recruited by famous leaders and fought for their master's glory, rather than a distinct national cause. Total War Three Kingdoms introduces its own reserves and supply system to complement its betrayal of military strategy, something which the community has been asking for quite a while. Each commandery will now be able to hold reserves in their cities. These are replenished when food stockpile is positive and reduced when it is negative. It dictates how long cities can last sieges. When reserves run out in a commandery, it triggers a food crisis and resultingly causes public unrest. You can upgrade the reserve storage with building chains such as grain storage or military infrastructure. The supply system which works hand in hand, armies will now continuously require supplies as they move across the map. Keeping supplies high gives bonuses such as increased morale, replenishment and ammunition. Armies get supplied by a friendly commandery's reserve. Some other effects such as costly military defeats or seasonal winter will also affect supplies. When an army loses all of its supplies, it will start taking attrition, but can also replenish its supplies by taking them from enemy armies after defeating them. On paper, this seems like a really cool system and should force the player to think more strategically about how they move their armies or at least consider how they can supply their armies as they campaign across the map. And that is true, at least in the early game. By the mid to late game, even with food shortages, reforms and character traits overpower any negative supply modifier and this system becomes entirely redundant. Hell, you can even march your army onto the other side of the map and still have no issues with supply. The idea is good on paper but in practice becomes too irrelevant in later stages of the game, even though it should be an ever present problem for any military commander. Another huge upgrade that has been executed extremely well is the diplomacy system. Firstly, there are now an amazing array of new options for diplomacy, including specific war declarations and demands, trading food or ancillaries, diplomatic marriages, even trading regions have returned to this edition of Total War. Players can now form coalitions instead of committing to a full-fledged alliance, or oversee their vassals with an unprecedented amount of diplomatic options. Furthermore, once reaching the late game and becoming a kingdom, factions can even confederate or call on the abdication of other kings in their efforts to unify China. The probability of diplomatic treaties being approved are also clearly outlined, with a numerical system that factors in military strength, respectability and attitude that the player can easily skew back and forth to meet demands. The depth of diplomacy is honestly staggering. The system has been further enhanced with the introduction of faction personalities. As we previously discussed, characters have their own personalities through their Wu Xing elements and push these with diplomatic agendas they try to pursue during the campaign. This reduces the repetitiveness of diplomatic negotiations as dealing with each faction will be on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a real breakthrough to the depth of the game as Total War Three Kingdoms has definitively the best diplomacy system in the series. Total War Three Kingdoms has removed the bothersome agents mechanic of previous games, replacing it with the undercover network mechanic. Factions can assign spies from their character pool and send them to engage in subterfuge with another faction. Patch 1.5 also introduced the feature of turncoats, a way to recruit disgruntled characters currently in another faction to spy for you. During their spying campaign, characters will try to insert themselves into the faction hierarchy, 
possibly entering government or pursuing military appointment, opening up a range of new options that allow you to hinder your enemy's progress whilst assisting yourself. Turning over a family member may also allow them to assassinate the faction leader or heir, instigating a civil war, or even ceding territories to your own faction. This is potentially a very powerful mechanic, but there's little opportunity to utilize it fully because of how difficult some of the options are to pull off. However, I have had a few instances of these events turning out great, so I feel it is in the right place gameplay wise. High risk, high reward, but very difficult to trigger. It is a great replacement to the agent system, which was intrusive and borderline problematic. In an attempt to keep every playthrough fresh, every faction in Total War Three Kingdoms will have faction specific mechanics, which slightly assist their progression through the campaign. For instance, Lu Bu's faction in the A World Betrayed DLC has the greatest warriors mechanic, a set of character targets Lu Bu can defeat in combat to unlock bonuses in reference to his fighting ability. Cao Cao, on the other hand, has the credibility mechanic which he can use to influence diplomatic attitudes or instigate proxy wars, a representation of his political acumen. 1.5 patch introduced mercenary treaties through the bandit rework, allowing all bandit factions to fight other factions' wars in return for monetary and diplomatic rewards. These faction-specific mechanics are usually minor, however, and although they attempt to reduce the repetitiveness of playing new campaigns, the gameplay loop is very similar across the board. Each faction will also have a few unique units available only to them. Again, another way to reduce the monotony of army recruitment. But most of the factions will build similar looking armies anyways, with the exception of bandits or the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Overall, the fact that despite having some differences, most factions will inevitably be pushed into a similar gameplay loop is ultimately a negative to replayability due to the lack of substantial cultural differences. To add some historical storytelling and world building immersion, there are a set of events and dilemmas that trigger as the campaign progresses. All factions will begin with a dilemma they must overcome, shaping the way their early game pans out. For instance, early in the South Cao campaign, the player will have to make a decision on whether or not to pursue revenge against Tao Chan for killing his father. Some famous historical events of the Three Kingdoms are also represented in this game, killing certain characters or spawning new ones, roughly correlating to events that actually transpired in real life. Some events also trigger major scripted sequences, massively changing the landscape of the campaign. These include Dong Zhou's assassination or the fall of Chang'an as the city gets engulfed in a civil war. Overall, this is a pleasant addition that really immerses the player into the story of Three Kingdoms. However, the campaign is only really scripted in the first few years before becoming the sandbox experience associated with Total War. I feel like this is a really good mix of scripted versus sandbox campaign design, as Creative Assembly has taken advantage of the rich source material, but not steering too far away from the classic experience. The method of progression through the campaign is through increasing faction ranks. As factions consolidate and slowly get stronger and stronger, they gain prestige either through conquering territory, constructing certain buildings or researching reforms. There is also a powerful Imperial Jade Seal that starts with Sun Jin's faction. The bearer of this object receives immense prestige and legitimacy as their rightful ruler. Warlords advance from the rank of Noble at the beginning of the game to second Marcus, then Marcus, steadily gaining more and more benefits through each rank, but also incurring higher and higher global threat levels, making diplomacy tougher. Once they reach the rank of Duke, their faction becomes a Duchy, and once they reach King status, they become a Kingdom. These final two ranks wield great power, unlocking powerful government positions in elite Imperial Palace Guard units but also massive diplomatic penalties, such as the inability to ally with other kingdoms. Some other factions, such as Dong Zhou, Zheng Zhang, and the Yellow Turbans will have different names for this progression, but the experience will be similar. As the name suggests, the Three Kingdoms period eventuated into the formation of three political entities, 
and that is the basis of the campaign's endgame period. Once a faction reaches the rank of king, the leader declares themselves as the new emperor, deposing the old dynasty. The next two strongest factions will immediately declare themselves emperor as well, jumping to kingdom ranks. As a result, the finale will be contested with the three kingdoms trying to eliminate each other in sort of a free-for-all. But the now various minor factions can also put their hat in the ring by taking over one of the three imperial capitals. The victory condition is thus then quite simple. Conquer the other pretender capitals whilst defending your own, to become the one true emperor. The great thing about this endgame is the sandbox nature of which factions can become the final three kingdoms. For instance, in my first Sao Tsao campaign, the actual historic three kingdoms emerged, with myself as Sao Tsao forming the kingdom of Wei, Sun Jian forming the kingdom of Wu, and Liu Bei forming the kingdom of Shu Han. And for the most part, these are the three strongest factions, so they have the highest chance to reach this endgame scenario. But I've also seen other factions declare themselves emperor as well. In my Liu Bei campaign, the three kingdoms were contested between myself, Zhao Cao Cao's kingdom of Wei, and Gongsun Zan's kingdom of Yan. In my Liu Bu campaign, my kingdom of Yin, Ma Tang's kingdom of Liang, and Sun Se's kingdom of Wu were the final contestants. Despite all the misgivings about repetitive gameplay, the campaign's sandbox nature allows for some interesting endgame scenarios with factions not traditionally associated as being powerhouses, and that is a great redeeming factor about Total War Three Kingdoms campaigns. The differences between Records and Romance mode are not very pronounced in campaigns. There are subtle differences that we covered such as the Resolve stat in Records increasing the General's bodyguard size rather than the Hero's health pool. Some non-historical characters and related events are omitted from records mode, such as Dao Chan, Lu Bu's lover, a figment from the romance novel. Overall, the experience in campaigns is similar, with the fundamental differences between both modes are the way the battles play out. In conclusion, Total War Three Kingdoms campaign sees an immense generational leap in terms of gameplay features, improvements and immersive storytelling from previous historical titles. Having said that, despite the numerous forward leaps, Total War Three Kingdoms still falls into the recognizable trappings of the series, with not enough differentiation between faction gameplay and some mechanics divulging into repetition. As a result, Three Kingdoms is a very fresh experience of the bat, but can become noticeably stale. Easily the most dramatic and cinematic spectacle of Total War games are the real-time battles, and with the audio-visual improvements we discussed earlier, the gameplay has also been enhanced to provide one of the most enjoyable and culturally inspired battle experiences in Total War. Firstly, let's check out the unit roster available. As many factions are culturally the same, their rosters will mostly be very similar, besides some unique units exclusive to each faction. For this fact, the game's unit roster can be repetitive, and players may find themselves fighting the same enemy units over and over again. All units are grouped into the five Wu Xing elements. For the fire elements, the focus is on shock cavalry. These lance and halberd wielding horsemen offer the main charging options to break through enemy lines. They're usually heavily armored, possess very high armor piercing damage and charge bonuses, but are vulnerable to arrow fire and bog down engagements. The earth element features melee cavalry. More effective against infantry, they are usually shielded and serve as heavier units capable of supporting infantry on the front lines or chasing down archers in the back lines, sort of a Chinese heavy version of Hussar. The wood element revolve around polearm infantry with spears, glaives and the G halberd as the focus. Resultingly, these units feature spearmen and infantry designed to hold the flanks, especially since their long-reaching weapons increase their effectiveness against cavalry. However, their great defensive stats usually make them hardy frontline troops as well, especially since they can form formations such as spear walls. 
The metal element, on the other hand, contains more traditional sword and shield infantry designed to assault the enemy lines with their high base damage and high attack rates. Armed with axes, sabers, glaives or jian swords, melee infantry usually form the crux of the front line but can also be utilized in flanking assault squadrons to get at the enemy's back lines. Finally, the water element revolve around range units. Archers, mounted archers, crossbowmen, and artillery form the backline support units designed to deliver all manners of devastation from afar, with their weaker combat stats making them quite fragile in close combat. Ultimately, the unit rosters of armies will be affected by which general you bring, as their respective element dictates which certain units you can muster. The addition of larger-than-life generals have been wholeheartedly embraced into Total War Three Kingdoms, and this is one of the defining differences between Romance and Records mode. In Romance, legendary characters appear by themselves on the battlefield, statistically overpowered, and equipped with a selection of skills and passive abilities that make them crucial weapons in the battle proceedings. Anything from morale buffs to magical phoenix slams that cause massive AoE damage. Not quite Warhammer level in terms of magic, but enough to breach the fantasy barriers. Any campaign additions, such as giving your characters bows, will also apply over into battle mode, allowing them access to ranged fire. In this mode, much of the gameplay will revolve around controlling the superheroes and activating their abilities at key moments to turn the tide of battle. Conversely, in Records mode, the generals will be escorted with a complement of bodyguard cavalry, and their stats are distributed instead over the entire unit. Most noticeably, there are no skills or abilities, not even any encourage or morale boosting abilities we see in older historical Total War games. This detrimentally reduces their uniqueness as characters and instead merely replaces them as an elite cavalry unit although one you will be hesitant to use as the generals themselves are now much more fragile. Romance mode also comes with an exclusive fundamental system, dueling. A new feature of Total War Three Kingdoms, dueling allows two opposing generals to face off one another in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Often to the death, the winner of these duels gains morale advantages for the rest of the battle, whilst the losing side incurs morale losses. Not only a feast to the eyes with their well choreographed matched combat animations, dueling also provides a degree of tactical flexibility. Duels can be used to purposefully kill a general and defer morale loss to the enemy units, or to distract enemy generals that can otherwise wreak havoc on the battle lines. Dueling results are usually decided by whoever wields the best weapon or wears the best armor, but timely use of abilities also help. Furthermore, the five different character types are all variable in their effectiveness during dueling, with champions being the best one-on-one -on -one fighters, commanders being the worst. Strategists cannot duel each other in the base game. In records mode, despite the lack of true dueling and all the interface that comes with it, generals can still pseudo-duel one another if their units get intermixed in combat, but it's definitely a messier, less obvious affair. So, which units should you bring to bear, and what's the most effective army composition in this edition of Total War? Well, even after several nerfs, there are two clear groups of standout units that prove very destructive, range units and shock cavalry, or the water and fire units. Even today, range units are still very powerful, and every army should bring at least a few of these. Archers will form the main body of ranged infantry, high rates of fire and access to flame and or poison arrows makes them extremely versatile, and most players will bring 4, 5 or even an entire retinue of them for reliable trickle damage. Crossbows are generally less popular due to their much slower rate of fire, but bringing one or two to target the heavily armored elite troops of your enemies with their armor piercing bolts are a consideration. Artillery, such as trebuchets, were also notoriously powerful. Patch 1.4 somewhat nerfed artillery, especially the trebuchet's accuracy, whilst adding a multiple bolt crossbow piece that compensated the lack of medium range artillery. Players will want to bring one or two artillery into battle, but it is entirely viable to skip them altogether in favor of cheaper but more versatile archers or crossbowmen. Siege artillery are even more important in campaigns as they allow an army to quickly skip the siege stage and immediately assault any fortified settlement. Finally, in this group we should also mention Mounted Archers, a consistently problematic unit type throughout the series, but I don't really find them as obnoxious in this edition of Total War. 
They are definitely not core selections, but if you're running certain factions that have unique ranged cavalry, there is a consideration, such as the White Horse Fellows of Gong Sun Zan or the Chiang Hunters of Matung. Resultingly, due to their access to highly versatile and damaging units, deploying a strategist retinue is almost always required. In campaign, you can even boost your strategist cutting stat, which increases ammunition reserves, allowing your ranged units to fire many more shots over the course of the battle. Cavalry is arguably one of the most satisfying units to utilize thanks to magnified impact effects, improved unit collision, and ragdoll animations. Cavalry is the decisive arm in this Total War game, and their adept usage will decide the outcomes of battles. In particular is the emergence of Shock Cavalry. Well-timed charges often decide entire battles, as they can heavily disrupt formations and initiate a domino effect of mass rout. Their weighty feel means that for the first time in Total War, Shock Cavalry is not just expensive elite cavalry that are awkward and cumbersome to control, requiring finesse and micromanagement to get the most out of them, like in Rome 2. In Three Kingdoms, Shock Cavalry will do damage wherever they are sent and pose as a unit of critical threat to opponents. Resultingly, they were also slightly nerfed by Creative Assembly, but their importance in army compositions in the current state of the game cannot be ruled out. This is coupled with the apparent weakness and lack of meaningful contribution offered by the other cavalry branch, the melee cavalry of the Earth Element. Ideally, they are used to seek out the Archer Lion or fight amongst the infantry in the thick of battle, but Shock Cavalry can equally deal with Archers with their amazing charge bonus, and their charge cycling tactics in Hammer and Anvil means they pose more of a long-term threat to infantry anyway. Furthermore, Shock Cavalry can also fulfill anti-cavalry roles, benefiting from their cavalry bonus due to equipping polearm weaponry. As a result, commanders are arguably the weakest of the general classes in this game, as their exclusive units are outperformed by vanguard units, and they are the weakest dueling class as well, making them low on the tier list for selection in army compositions. This is meant to be outweighed by their battlefield-wide abilities, but the trade-off, in my opinion, is not worth it. Consequently, most players opt to bring a vanguard class, deploying them with about 4 units or cost permitting even a full retinue of cavalry. Any free slots can be used for spare infantry. Infantry choices are dictated by the Champion and Sentinel classes, as they have access to the majority of infantry units. Sentinels make compelling choices as they are durable in battle, thanks to their high expertise stat boosting melee evasion, their useful frontline abilities such as tempered deflection, and their access to melee assault infantry, the bread and butter of armies. Despite this, champions are the superior choice, as the champion class does more damage, useful when dueling other generals, and their infantry choices are not bad either. Their polearm infantry are intended to be more useful on the flanks, providing a barrier against marauding cavalry, but shielded spear units are very capable frontline units as well. They have amazing defensive stats. They don't deal much damage against other infantry, but they can equally survive for a very long time against them. Durable meat shields to support a more cavalry-centric assault. Furthermore, their G infantry trades defensive stats for more offense, making them a versatile unit from the wood element group that can hold the central line or provide flank support against cavalry, a jack of all trades, master of none type of unit. Sentinels can thus field strong assault infantry to form the core of the front line, sort of an infantry based army like Roman legionnaires. Champions, on the other hand, can bring polearm infantry and soak up pressure as the anvil whilst a dedicated cavalry arm delivers the main punch as the hammer. A couple of spear units on the flanks are also very useful to protect against cavalry. One of the best features of Total War Three Kingdoms is how smooth the battles are. Moving around units and issuing precise orders are all very responsive and snappy. This again is a testament to the improvements to unit collision, where units don't get bogged down into massive blobs like in Rome 2, requiring spam clicks just to get them out of there. This really also enhances the control of cavalry. In Rome 2, I really felt that a cavalry charge was a one-time commitment because I'd essentially lose too many units or cohesion to really make them useful again. In Three Kingdoms, cavalry charges are so devastating that it will be the infantry meeting them that will struggle to regroup themselves. Combat is smooth and polished, there's a lot more dynamism to the animations compared to previous titles. This is one of the few games I actually prefer to zoom in and watch the events unfold. 
Not much tactical innovation is provided for the player in this Total War unfortunately, and that is most likely due to the monotonous nature of the unit roster. It's also important to note that this is one of these gameplay experiences which is fundamentally different between Romance and Records mode. Given the strength of ranged units as the attacker, you want to close the gap immediately with the enemy, getting your infantry engaged as soon as possible to reduce the casualties taken from ranged fire. Given the strength of cavalry as well, nullifying or distracting the cavalry threat in the early period of the battle is imperative. Seeking out the enemy's cavalry and either matching them one for one or outright attempting to destroy them is paramount. Most battles will be decided with whichever side can unlock their cavalry first from this initial engagement. Keeping one or two cavalry units in reserve, maneuvering into position to charge their lines or chase down archers while this is happening is also a consideration, so it helps to bring a numerical cavalry superiority. Given that most players and the AI almost always deploy cavalry on the flanks, deploying a couple of spear units here to meet them, ready to rush into cavalry formations and bog them down is another great distraction method. Once the pinnacle cavalry fight is decided, the overall tactic is to then roll up the flanks, using the unleashed cavalry to charge in from behind, unlocking more and more of your infantry, slowly encircling around the enemy's center. Usually this means you want to position your best and most elite units in the center, as they will be the ones engaged in battle for the longest continuous time. However, I've also experimented with assault squads coming in from the flanks, consisting mostly of axes since they are great versus shield bearing infantry, and have a high charge bonus that somewhat mimics a cavalry charge. Slamming them into the backsides of engaged enemies often yields a less dramatic but no less capable effect, and could be a useful alternate strat if your cavalry is otherwise pinned down. So it seems hammer and anvil tactics are just the most effective and easiest to implement tactic. The clearly defined roles of infantry and cavalry kind of shoehorn battlefield maneuvers into trying to encircle your enemies. And this is where we reach the greatest differences between records and romance mode. For one, records has been fine-tuned to be much more realistic. Battles will be longer, managing fatigue and morale much more important. Whereas in romance, tactics are less important as you can kind of carry battles with overpowered, overleveled and overkitted legendary characters. We've seen the memes of Lubu fighting entire armies by himself, but they are not far off from the mark. Combined with the fact that battles are much more chaotic and quick affairs in romance mode, the room for tactical acumen is considerably reduced. In romance, often the characters that can beat their opposing number in a duel will invariably decide the outcome of battle, as having a morale debuff and no characters left will definitely leave the losing side in an irretrievable position. This has also seen certain tactics developed aimed at sniping the enemy generals early on, almost always resulting in victory. Furthermore, due to the power of abilities and skills, their timely use is often more important than tactical maneuvers, and this may be a genuine decision to appeal to fans of the Warhammer titles where magic is ingrained in the gameplay. As a result, mainly for this reason, most historical Total War fans will gravitate towards records mode. It is definitively the more strategic style, allowing players to exercise more tactical flexibility, but this mode also has its downsides. For one, the bodyguard complement for generals means that each side will essentially have three more cavalry units to use, making the cavalry dogfight all the much more important. Without skills or abilities, pure stats win battles. Managing morale and fatigue for your units is paramount, as there is less ability to intervene from your generals. And that is fine, but it also doesn't allow the spontaneity or the drama of heroic actions from particular characters, which is what Three Kingdoms is all about anyway. You're not going to be drawn to this game for the unique units and tactical innovation. The battles themselves, sure, are the prettiest in the series, but they are by no means the generational leap of gameplay seen in the campaign mode. So I think honestly, if you're going to buy this game, you might as well enjoy its more esteemed romance mode. Even if you are a historical purist, there's still a lot to love with the romantic side of Total War Three Kingdoms. It is of my opinion that battles do not elevate Total War Three Kingdoms, it is instead the competent engine that elevates the battles. The wonderful crisp animations and improvements to the unit collision and impact mechanics make battles a complete feast to the eyes, and very addictive to play. 
Despite the lack of tangible gameplay improvements, indeed some facets of it have regressed such as unit roster repetition and lack of tactical innovation, the battle's audio-visual experience carries the atmosphere whilst its engine improvements reduce the clunky and cumbersome drawbacks of previous titles. Battles of Total War Three Kingdoms are an amazingly pleasant experience, a real highlight of this game that will appeal to all fans of Total War. It has been a busy year for Creative Assembly's support of Total War Three Kingdoms, even with all their other projects going on. Five major patches and three major post-release DLCs suggest a continuous desire to improve this game. There was a period about six months into launch which saw the game devolve into a messy state, and one can only assume this was CA's persistent introduction of DLC and content patches without compensating with bug fix patches. They have rectified this however, and the game state as of writing of this video is almost top notch. Most major game breaking bugs have been patched and if there's a time to experience a great performing, immensely stable and almost bug free game version then it's right now. The especially pleasing part is the studio's willingness to provide free content. For instance, patch 1.5 added 16 legendary characters. 16! That's 16 characters with custom artwork and custom skill trees, playable in custom battles, and capturable in campaign mode. They've done this throughout the year, adding in quintessential Free Kingdoms figures to bolster the already extensive listing of pivotal characters. And long may it continue, for there are still more notable exceptions in the game that still need custom artworks. DLC releases over the year for Total War Three Kingdoms have mostly been chapter packs, adding a substantial amount of content, and this is a nice model as it feels more like expansion packs rather than the cheap DLCs CA have been pushing out for other games. In saying that however, they have mostly been hit or miss, the first two were anywhere from mediocre to downright bad. With the most recent A World Betrayed, the first DLC I really felt enjoyable enough and would happily play again over the vanilla campaign. Furthermore, the gameplay loop, as we discussed earlier, is kind of being recycled over and over with the DLC, not really much innovation is happening and the experiences are getting repetitive. However, the future looks bright. Creative Assembly have recently released their next major DLC, The Furious Wild, coinciding with another major patch, 1.6. And this is interesting as it adds the Nan Man culture, unique tribal factions from the jungles of southern China. The first time Creative Assembly is diverging from the central Han culture, already extensively covered with the current state of the game. Hopefully this will finally bring some freshness into the stale unit roster, the battle tactics and campaign progression. With this, I'm hoping CA also begins to cover more exterior cultures as well, such as the Zhongnu tribes of the Northern Steppes or the Goryeo culture of the Korean Peninsula, both very relevant to the Three Kingdoms period due to their historical interactions. The campaign map already has references to such regions, so it might be a future direction anyway. Now, modding really only deserves a brief note, as Creative Assembly have always wholeheartedly supported the modding community, and this has continued into Total War Three Kingdoms. The mod launcher, modding toolkits, and accessibility support with the Steam Workshop has truly unlocked public potential. Add in the extra fervor and manpower of the Chinese fan base, and you have one of the most mod-friendly games and extensive modding communities the Total War series has ever seen. Long may it continue. The famous Three Kingdoms period is finally brought into the Total War engine with Creative Assembly's sure but delicate touch. The East Asian cultural setting is executed well. There is enough context, periodization, characters and storytelling to appeal to enthusiasts of ancient China and welcome newcomers alike. 8 out of 10. Definitively Total War's most beautiful, most atmospheric and perhaps most importantly, best performing and stable title, a true generational leap to usher in the next decade for this franchise, 9 out of 10. From the outset, a very fresh experience with ample improvements to keep new fans and veterans of the series hooked from the get-go. Several campaigns in, however, the experience does become noticeably stale and repetitive with most factions playing very similar, 7 out of 10. 
The best gameplay to be had in Total War 3 Kingdoms are the battles, the combined audiovisual experience, engine improvements to unit collision and cohesion, and the atmosphere presented in this simulator provide an addictive and enticing imagery of ancient Chinese warfare. Again though, a repeated unit roster and inherent similarities between factions eventually makes battles lose a bit of their luster. 8 out of 10. Creative Assembly have no doubt improved their post-release model with strong modding support, constructive patches featuring loads of free content, and more expansive paid DLCs. Reception to the DLC content has been divisive, however, though their future direction may be a sign of better things to come. 7 out of 10. Overall, I give this game a weighted rating of 8 out of 10. Total War Three Kingdoms currently runs for an unchanged since release price of $60 US, essentially cementing it within the realm of AAA game prices. But for its natural longevity and sandbox nature, Total War games have always been seen as great value, and this price is honestly quite fair for the game. Total War games seldom go on sale until about a year after release, so possible buyers may also want to wait for that opportunity. Despite being a day one DLC, Yellow Turban Rebellion ranks among the best received of the Three Kingdoms DLC, mainly for the fact the pack adds three new factions with a fresh campaign experience compared to the vanilla factions. It's definitely not required, but if you have an interest to play the conflict from a new perspective with spiritual connotations, religiosity and themes of liberty, this DLC will appeal to you. 8 out of 10 and it's a solid DLC at only $9 US. Despite my hatred for paid DLC just to get what is virtually a cosmetic pack, I do consider this DLC essential because blood, gore and dismemberment go hand in hand with warfare like bread and butter, and it's basically the price of a cup of coffee. My moral compass however has to penalise the score despite it improving the atmosphere of the game greatly, 5 out of 10. For the same price as the Yerla Turban DLC, 8 Princes is extremely poorly executed, almost as if it was haphazardly rushed into existence and covers an obscure, relatively uninteresting post Three Kingdoms conflict. Eight Princes DLC should be immediately skipped by all players unless the context specifically appeals to you, and even then. 2 out of 10, the worst Three Kingdoms DLC by some margin. Mandate of Heaven, released in January 2020, set 8 years before the base game, covering the period before the Yellow Turban Rebellion broke out. It is a decent DLC, adds the playable Han Empire and some minor constituent Imperial Loyalist factions, a focus on a defensive Attila style campaign, but doesn't substantially improve the gameplay loop. It's worth a punt, but easily skippable at $10 US, 6 out of 10. The latest major DLC introduces factions led by some fan favourite characters, specifically Lu Bu and Sun Se. Set 4 years after the base game, these factions have much more unique mechanics that revitalise playability, but not enough for an amazing recommendation. Definitely a step in the right direction and probably the most value out of all the chapter packs thus far. 7 out of 10 and get it on the sale. Total War Three Kingdoms is a breath of fresh air from Creative Assembly's mainline historical titles. Years and years of dredging through European settings finally see them take a stab at China's most renowned and romanticized period. Resultingly, Total War Three Kingdoms delivers one of the most unique and fresh experiences of the franchise, with a focus on character dynamics and interpersonal storytelling, giving it a particularly intimate perspective from a traditionally faction or nation-oriented viewpoint. Common trappings of Total War still persist, such as the eventual repetition and staleness of the gameplay loop, but given Creative Assembly's strong track record of support over the past year, the game is still ready to be expanded and enhanced upon. This is my new favourite Total War game, but there is the possibility of recency bias in my statement. It's the first Total War title I've really had to take the effort in to learn the new mechanics and intricacies, because the game takes such a massive leap from previous games, making it particularly memorable. The change in design philosophy and refreshing level of polish should compare very favourably to the other historical titles, and veteran fans of the series should really consider purchasing this game. This was Total War Three Kingdoms, a year in review.